Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pineapple Podcast. Today, we have an amazing guest, Lori Meperoff. She's an avid investor, an educator, and a woman that's pioneering this space and this industry. So I'm looking forward to chatting with her today as we talk about, you know, finding the right projects and funding the right projects. Lori May, welcome to the Pineapple Podcast. Mitch, thank you so much for asking me on today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So if you want to give our viewers a quick snapshot of your of who you are and what you do, and then let's jump into some conversations. Hmm, who I am. So I'm, uh, I'm retired. <laughs> this is what retirement looks like on me. Uh, I discovered um, a real estate uh, investing corporation. Can I name it? Absolutely. That's what we're here. Excellent. <laughs> so I discovered Keyspire uh, after I had two, uh, two investment condos. Um, and I thought because I had two condos plus my own property that I had maxed out the number that the banks would allow me. Uh, Keyspire, uh, my husband encouraged me to go to a Keyspire bank, go talk to Scott, ask him how he managed to get more than three mortgages from a bank. Uh, so I did, and I figured it out, and here I am. <laughs> so now, uh, eight years into my Keyspire journey, I run 11 corporations all devoted to real estate investing. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I mean, and that's what I love about it. You know, it's like you take something, you learn about it, and you embrace it, right? And then you make something of it. And like you say, this is what retirement looks like, right? Mm -hmm. That's my my idea of retirement. It just means <laughs> I don't set an alarm clock in the morning. <laughs> Get up when I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. So one of the, the challenges that we always face with and a lot of investors, especially coming into, into the space new, just like what you were doing, it's really, you know, they often feel stuck. They feel like, you know, they're uncertain with their decisions. You know, they're not sure the deal in front of them. Is it a right deal or a wrong deal, you know? So I guess, you know, my, my first question to you is, how do you determine what's a right deal? So for me in that space, I remember yeah. it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I just picked the easiest one because <laughs> I knew that I had to break the ice and wow. I had a whole list of things that I wanted to try uh, to do. Um, but uh, picking the easiest one and feeling some success and some motivation build from that easy investment yes. led me to the next one and the next one. I, I chuckle when I talk to people about doing renovation projects. So some people say, well, I want an easy lipstick one. I just want to be able to paint it. Once you've done a few renovation projects, you paint it one time, next time you paint it, and you, you add some flooring. And the next time you change some countertops, and the next time you change it. Now I got them completely, and I still consider it a lipstick renovation. Because <laughs> it's easy once you build just yes. a little bit every time. Uh, so how do I find deals was the question. I find deals uh, more so I find partners. So I have conversations with people. I probably do uh, six to eight hours of networking conversations a day. And I really enjoy that aspect of my business. Right. Um, and through that, I start to meet people who are doing some pretty amazing things. So I haven't found too many deals on my own. It's always through partners. Um, and I don't the numbers are somewhat important, of course, uh, but more so the jockey. I'm, I'm betting on my partner being able to execute. I learned from some bad partnerships early on that um, people can tell you anything. <laughs> they can present the numbers and spin them in any which direction. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're better off to have an investment with somebody you know, like, and trust somebody you'd be happy to go out and have a meal with or invited to your home to stay the weekend. Yes. Um, if, if that's that person, you're going to have a much more um, enjoyable partnership experience and likely more, um, more lucrative as well. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a brilliant insight there, uh, for sure, because you're right. Putting something on paper, at the end of the day, it's Excel, right? You can make it look any which way you want to make it look. Yeah, so add some pretty colors. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you can't make the decision. Well, the presentation looked so good, I had no choice but to choose it. Did you look at the property? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, you, did you actually validate anything? Did you do due diligence, right? 
Has this particular person ever executed this strategy before? And it's okay if they have not. I have partnered with a few people where they're on the learning curve and that's okay, but there has to be some, some consideration given to that. We're on a learning curve here. It's going to take a little bit longer. We possibly might make some mistakes. Is there enough cushion in our numbers to be able to absorb these new learning experiences? Brilliant. Absolutely true. I mean, like, you know, even for me, I look at numbers and I do, do similar things with you. I do things on my own and I partner up with people because they bring a whole different level of strength, as you rightly say, and perspective, right? And we often talk about, well, real estate, you can't really do it alone. You need a team. You right? do. Absolutely. So it's not just the trades guys or the, the real estate agents or the brokers. It's, it's a combination of people that you can work with because I agree 100%. You, you can't find all the deals yourself. This is not a one-man show, you know? No, I'm, so, I'm not good at finding deals. <laughs> I'm better at finding people that have deals. <laughs> there you go. Exactly, exactly. I think that's the niche. And for our members, our viewers, you know, again, guys, you know, this is about you finding, you know, what's the right spot for you. And, and Laurie, I think, you know, you've alluded to something really important. You found the way to find your deals in alignment with goals, right? Because now I'm sure you're pretty clear on your strategy and your goals. Find the people with the right deals and bring in the value that you bring, which is, as you say, you network eight hours a day talking to people. So mm -hmm. clearly you're going to be helping those people put their capital to work. And we'll, we'll touch on that for sure. But I, I, I'd like to get an, a sense of alignment with your goals. What was that like for you? Because I think, you know, we come into the space and it's like all the strategies can work guaranteed but they don't work for everybody and i think people get Absolutely. get locked into that what's for me you know so that's how i wound up running 11 different corporations <laughs> i uh, i i yeah it's one thing to book learn a strategy and some of them are just mm -hmm. phenomenal um in yes. for example short-term rentals yeah absolutely phenomenal strategy and people are just killing it out there they're not yes. for me I tried it. I don't like it. It's a full time job. It's like people, new people moving in freaking every day. <laughs> it's just too much like work <laughs> you're, you're for right. me. But yeah. that's not to say that it isn't ideally what somebody else wants to do. Um, the furnishing of the properties I really like. So I transitioned my short term rentals into long term rent furnished rentals. And that way I still get to, to play Barbie, <laughs> dress up my dollhouse. But now Barbie pays me rent yeah. right. <laughs> and sticks around for a while. So that that yeah. works for me. So I like I like trying the different uh, different sorts of deals and basically seeing where they go. Those I like. I keep growing and building and working on and those that don't fulfill me in some way i stop doing i don't do those anymore beautiful so basically you've been able to really try and realize what's for you and what's not for you because you brought something very important right now sdr or short-term rental it's sexy it's People sexy it. yeah go you for know. it <laughs> that's it some people are hitting some amazing cash flow but you got to be prepared to be answering a lot of email and text messages continuously. Or paying somebody a freaking fortune to do it for you. Um, and then how responsive are they? Your whole star rating is based on their performance. So it can be challenging. Absolutely. And depending on what you're doing with your strategy, then it may or may not work, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's brilliant. Talking about the SDR. And then in, in your case, you, you've said you've kind of, flipped it over where you're renting, but you're doing furnished renting. So a little bit more that's, on this side. That's the ones I was doing. Uh, so I am still partnered with somebody uh, who, who does the uh, management portion of our STR in Mexico. So we still have that property and she's, mm -hmm. she's wonderful. She takes care of everything uh, along those lines and she loves to do it. So that's, <laughs> that's for her then. <laughs> very nice, very nice. And then we have other strategies, right? You have renovations, you have conversions, you have buy and hold, flip to yourself. There's so much opportunities in real estate and some of the creative ones, like now you're going into, you can do infill lot developments, conversions, land development, building from the ground up, you know? There's Can't so- Can't find much. it out there, build it. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. And the government said they're going to be putting $10 billion behind that, right? I'm very yeah. excited about that. How much of that $10 billion are you going after? Uh, probably $100 million. Okay. <laughs> I'm in for nine and a half <laughs> of the 10 available. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. So, so tell me your insights in terms of some of the more creative side of, of the, the real estate, because you know, the banks typically don't take any risk. And that's the opportunity for us as investors to go after those deals, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so learning how to do due diligence is uh, definitely a, an acquired skill. Um, I, I think the best way to learn how to do due diligence is to either fail or have some very frightening moments <laughs> in your in your investing yeah. history, and that teaches you which questions to ask. Uh, one of the partners I brought on board is my lawyer, and his job is to go after um, people to with to he does contracts and and uh, prosecutor for for contracts to make sure that uh, people do what they say they're going to do according to the terms of the agreements. Uh, so he's a very handy person to have on board to to read those documents for me and to understand what terms and conditions are enforceable and which are not. So just uh, just being in the space for a while taught me how to how to navigate those <laughs> those scary situations. Um, I do enjoy finding some of the quote riskier projects. So for for example, um, in Ontario specifically, um, anywhere in Canada, but specifically Ontario, I find the need for it. Multifamily has become quite a sexy purchase. People are liking to buy six, 12, 20, 40 unit buildings. Yeah. Absolutely a great strategy. However, in Ontario, it's damn near impossible to get tenants out. You can cash for keys, but even that is, <laughs> so to get them out to renovate, to improve the performance and the value of the property is challenging. That's a great investment. So I can now, provide a mortgage for somebody who's in that space so that they have private money. Yes, my private money is expensive, but it's short term. You flip it out to a traditional bank or to a CMHC or one of the new CMHC programs are pretty amazing too. Absolutely. That's absolutely true because uh, CMHC is pushing the envelope with, with landlords to really improve the properties and give them the term for it. And I like what you said there. It is absolutely true. Some of the markets in Canada, across Canada now, the multifamily has always been sexy, but the cash flow is being eroded because sellers are basically asking for crazy pricing. So you have to now come in and convert that to a profitable business, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, I think some markets that's more challenging than other markets. Um, yeah. I find um, I find Ontario that's particularly challenging because, well, the federal government is working very, very diligently to try and find ways to make a developer's life easier and a renovator's life easier to provide more affordable housing. The landlord tenant board sticking a cap of 1.2%. Like, hello, <laughs> you're you're asking me to be a song lord. I can't afford to fix anything. <laughs> That's exactly it. And they don't seem to get it. Government they really don't get it. very separated from reality, you know. Okay. Uh, and I think a politician is a politician and are not truly a policy driver, right? Which means to say you should be thinking private sector, get people who's really interested in stuff to make it work because you want to balance you you want to have a healthy economy healthy balance between investors and, and and renters right so it's quite interesting that that position for sure you know some of the other things about that about a little bit of a break on that 45 percent tax of, of passive investing uh, CRA and I have a little bit of a disagreement about what the term passive means when it comes to managing rental properties <laughs> there's nothing passive with that exactly <laughs> <laughs> call them all righty that's right yeah so if they really want to spark things why don't they try breaking that tax down a little bit so that it's something a little more reasonable to encourage more investors to come in I'm I'm there's spaces for affordable housing in in my Alberta market affordable is more than I charge usually <laughs> 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 that is worrisome, but that's a reality. I mean, look at the cost of goods, look at the cost of everything, right? Even in your construction projects, like you're literally signing off, let's build this thing and we don't know the budget because wood price is changing every day. <laughs> True, but as long as you have enough cushion in your numbers, you're fine. 
And that's, that's exactly the point is we can still navigate. We just have to be pretty smart about how we're doing it as investors. So I tell investors, you know, it's not about now is not the right time or should we wait for things to get better? We don't know what the future holds, but we know that we can employ strategy and thinking and logic behind every deal. And you might go through many, many deals before you find that one gem, right? But that's a, that's a process. Uh, it is a process. I also don't believe that you should be waiting for the home run every time. Um, the, the big mega deals, they, they don't come along every day. And what is the lost opportunity cost of these smaller deals that maybe aren't quite as lucrative, but have a little bit of win in them? Yeah. If you get five or six of those strung together, you're probably further ahead than you are from your waiting for your home run that's three, four years down the road. So just, just get started. Break the ice. Do whatever is easiest and move forward from there. That momentum will build you. Nice. Absolutely. Now, you, you spoke about a couple of things that I just want to, to, to bring back. Now, you said you, you have one of your partners is actually your lawyers that reviews contracts and makes sure. I think you know, in terms of the contract, is it the contract with the tradespeople, the business partner, or the working partner, I should say, that's supposed to be doing what they're doing? Those are the contracts you're really looking at, because on the, the, the networking or the putting people's capital to work, I think that's a little bit different, correct? He does all my legal contracts. So if I have a loan agreement, he's the one that's helped me design it and put it out there. Um, if I have a JV agreement with working partners, he set up our JV agreement. He, his business is large enough that he does the incorporation for me. So it's a, it's a boutique law firm. So if he can't physically do it himself, there's somebody else in his department that can. Nice. Yeah. And, and let's jump into, into the world of, of uh, people coming in new. Everybody, you know, they put their hand up. I want to use other people's money. Um, there's a perception that there's just a place where other people's money exists. And, and I don't think people realize it's actually a job in itself to build that credit. I can't tell business. you how many people yeah. have reached out to me to ask me to buy them a house. I'm not going to buy you a house, dude. <laughs> like, bring to me a situation that I can invest in and let's talk. But I'm not going right. to buy you a house. <laughs> That's right. This I, is I, a charity day. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is the, the misconceptions of a lot of people because they hear the messaging outside, right? Yeah, there's other people's money. There's four ways to win. And some people, it's five ways to win. And people want to come in because they think it's easy. But I think we need to set some parameters for people to understand. Real estate is not easy. It no. just pays better than a day job. <laughs> I don't know. My day job, I used to work eight hours and go home. This job, I'm 16 hours frequently and sometimes wake up in the middle of night with the solution. <laughs> I'm loving every minute, right? Loving every minute would not change it at all. Absolutely. And I think that's the yeah. key. Here. It's love and joy is actually a measure, measuring meter in ourselves to know if we're on the right track or the wrong track, believe it or not. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, circling back to what you were saying about raising capital being a job, it, it is. Keeping track of due dates, keeping track of interest payments. Um, if you're not systems oriented, yes. hire somebody who is because you need solid systems in place to be able to stay on top of all those details and mess up the details once, especially <laughs> when you do most of your uh, work with people within one community. All I have to do is miss one interest payment <laughs> and I might as well just throw myself off the, off the cliff because there'll be a lynch mob after me. <laughs> Which to your point again comes to branding, right? Like you need to build a credible brand because money is out there and the money is just not worth the effort of screwing up somebody's deals. We respect the fact that we say other people's money, but you have to say that with a lot of respect is their hard earned dollars that they're trusting with you, right? Yes. So, you know, yes, I, I have had some investors come to me and they say, I've got this major project on the go and I'd like you to show me how I can go about raising capital. I just need 200,000. Just, just, 
well, I'm the working partner. I have to get paid too. Yeah, that's right. Because my 200,000 just sprung up behind me here one day and I was sleeping. I woke up and there it was. <laughs> no, I've already put in my work. Now you can put in your work. <laughs> Don't. Yeah, I, I do respect that my working partner is doing the work, but I do expect that respect that so am I. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And again, you know, people are coming up with these types of deals and to your point it's like okay well i'll pay myself i'll do this it's, it's not about yourself it's about making sure you're driving value what is the project is it profitable enough and i think that's a, the, the word they need to understand is it profitable enough because mm -hmm. when you're into the space of opm you're also in a higher interest payment bracket you right? are so, so yeah. yeah, so you got to make sure you're meticulous. You got to demonstrate to me as a financial person, hey, you know what you're doing, right? And, and as you said earlier, the track record. Somebody told me early on, um, if you're doing a renovation project, quadruple your dime line, double your expenses. Does it still work? Ah. That's one of my measuring sticks. Um, most times your timeline doesn't quadruple, but I can tell you out if I do 100 loans, 98 of them are going to ask for an extension. They None of them pay back on time. <laughs> it's just a hard, fast rule. So if you're looking to do an investment with private money and you have a hard stop that you must have the money back in six months, do not be looking at any deal longer than three months. <laughs> you, you know that it's going to yes. extend. Make sure you have a plan B because that person may or may not be able to pay you back on time. That's right. Absolutely important there because I have seen it where a lot of people are thinking I'm getting it back. I'm getting it back. On I'm Tuesday. Back. Tuesday yeah. I get paid. <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I yeah. have this money for your project. I mean, that, that doesn't yeah. show up, right? But I talked to my working partner last week and everything's been delayed, COVID stuff, you know, but he's paid me back Tuesday. With what? <laughs> Project's not done yet. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this is pretty insightful for me, right? Because again, when we talk to people, we want to understand, well, how do we raise capital? So if I do come to Laurie, me, I mean, you've, you've developed or evolved your business to a point where you can lend money but on the, on the back end, you're also doing the job of raising that capital so you can get it into the Mordor's corporation, right? So Yeah, most of the times I'm partnering with people, I am their capital provider. Yeah, so I'm raising money for, for their particular project frequently. Right. So <clears throat> if somebody wants to come in, they have the project, they're new, what's kind of like the best footprint? Everybody wants to go on uh, network, but they have no networking experience. They don't even have a list of people that they're talking to, but they just feel they got to do that. Let's let's give them a, a sense of, well, maybe the best approach is to find companies like yours and other brokers that can do private money because it's easier to access, especially with your timelines for closing and stuff, right? And then you've got to put yourself into a plan of action to build that network over time. Yes. So I would say the first thing that many uh, newer investors need to kind of come to grips with is slow down. <laughs> it's not going to you, you can't expect to have a multi-million dollar corporation in your hands in six weeks. It's not going to happen <laughs> or it's very unlikely that it's going to happen. Take your time build your network, maybe use your own money first in order to get that experience and that track record. Maybe you can JV after the fact. So get the get your project done using your own dime and then get your money back out by JVing it with somebody else. If JV is the strategy that you want to use. Um, if you want to borrow money, it's going to be tougher without a track record. Your market and your numbers are going to make some sense, but you're, and I'm not going to say you can't get it, but I will say it's not as easy as, <clears throat> as you might hope or maybe have been led to believe. Absolutely. And I think this is a, this is really important what you're saying here, because I want people to really understand this, is that you really have to slow down. You do have to take make a plan of action. You really have to create a marketing plan behind raising capital as one part of your business. And if you're the working partner, then you got to also make time for finding the right deal, you know, and the numbers have to work from your perspective. When that happens, 
then you can come over to, to the networking side and the people you're talking to and say, hey, here is the deal, here is the potential, here's my risk, and this is how we'll bring the deal together. So people another thing that I, another thing I think many people overlook is if you have 10 people that are interested in your deal, yes, and, and it looks like it's gonna go forward, mm-hmm. it is highly usual two of them are going to back out, at least two of them. So the, the deal closing date is going to come and they found another deal and put their money over there. The money they were expected to come in from their private deal got extended so they don't have it. Life happened. The roof roof is started leaking and they need that money for the roof. Whatever the reasoning is, they can be fully committed, fully interested, fully want to participate in your project, but don't have the funds. And you need to be expecting that, have backup plans in place. Good. So back up the backup plan. Back up the backup. If you're raising $100,000, you better have at least 125 out there because <laughs> you're not you're not likely going to see all 100 when you expect it. The other thing that happens is if you need the money on um, Friday for your closing, make yeah. sure that it's at your lawyer's trust account at least five business days ahead. Banks put five business days hold on money <laughs> and nobody can waive them. Even with receipts, if you have a really strong, long relationship with your bank manager, he might waive it, but it's a lot of paperwork for him to do so. So you're better off just to, to take that waiver period and have the project funded ahead. Even lawyers are getting phone calls now from the fraud departments at banks asking them if they know where this money is coming from, what is the purpose of the money, what is the intention, if it's over, they consider $10,000 big money. So anything over 10,000 they're looking at. Oh boy, so yeah, so more scrutiny, more scrutiny, more scrutiny. More scrutiny. When when there are um, collapses in the um, the private lending world, um, similar to what we've seen in the last few months, the ripple effects are astounding. It yes. um, it's a lot. It's kind of scary out there <laughs> for the for people like me that raise private capital. There's uh, there's a lot of nervousness in the market. There's a lot of correct and incorrect nervousness from the commissions and the banks that um, are side supports to the private lending market. Absolutely true. I mean that's that's one of the things with with, with navigating this space because. They're just looking at the optics. They, they just put random blanket uh, provisions from their side without really considering the true essence of what the, the good people are doing. One bad apple is all it takes, right? So syndicated mortgages out of Olympia Trust now, you need a mortgage administrator. That's if you have two people involved funding your deal at the same position. That's, um, that's great. If you're doing a great big project, no problem. <laughs> if you're yeah. doing smaller one-off here and there renovations, that's a bit of a hit on your on your bottom line. You have to factor those into your numbers. Absolutely. And those guys operate at a, on a percentage basis, not a flat fee. So they've just added significant cost to your project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where I'm quite happy to have more doors capital. <laughs> we're considered administrators, mm-hmm. so we're okay. <laughs> oh, very nice. And yeah. maybe, maybe for our views as well, because again, we're in a creative space. We we as investors, we're looking to get a better than uh, average return on our money by investing with people like yourself and other people within the space. And so Modos Capital, maybe you can share with, with our viewers as well. Well, how exactly does this work? Like it's a mortgage incorporation at the end of the day, but I think it's very alien to a lot of people coming in this space. So how does it work for me and what's the benefits? So you're absolutely right. It is completely alien. Uh, Before I started Mordor's Capital, the month before, I had no idea what a mortgage investment corporation was. I had never heard of it before. So actually, that lawyer was left on the screen. And what the F is a mick? (laughs) What is this? (laughs) It turns out it is essentially a, a step beyond a syndicated mortgage. So a a regular mortgage, you and I come together, I lend you the money, you use it, you pay me back. That's just a straight up regular mortgage. Banks do it all the time. Syndicated mortgage, you and I pool our funds together and we both put it towards one project, syndicated mortgage. 
Now, when you get into a mortgage investment corporation, you and I put our funds together. That forms the purse. The purse goes out in multiple mortgages, professionally manages lots of different mortgages out there. Mm -hmm. The returns come back, i.e. interest is paid on those mortgages, and that's distributed. The profits from that distributed back to the shareholders. That's how they make their money. Okay, very good. And if, if I wanted to invest with you so that you can invest into the multiple mortgages, what mm -hmm. does that look like to me? I buy shares, I'm just investing with you. Yep. yep, so I have different share classes available. Uh, right now I have class C and class D on offering. They have different risk tolerances. So you decide how you feel about risk. One is very conservative. The other one would be about a medium level risk. Uh, you decide which one feels better for you. And you talk with my exempt market dealer. Uh, who will vet you through all the securities, make sure I stay in securities compliance, make sure that this is a proper, reasonable deal for your portfolio, um, and buy the shares, and away we go. Oh, very nice. So that that's brilliant, because now it gives people another opportunity to put mm -hmm. your money to work. And I guess on the working capital side, they can come to you, and then they can fund their deals, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that said, <laughs> the MIC is rather new. <laughs> so uh, it's smaller to start and we're growing. We'll get there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I yeah. think as long as more people come to realize what's available to them, you know, like you say, it takes time to do everything right. You can't do it. In exactly. <laughs> So my belief when it comes to private lending and the way I've managed my portfolio since, uh, let's see, I joined Key Spire in 2014, and I probably got my head straight late 2015. Um, at first, I just thought, oh, this was paying 20%. Oh, this was paying 18%. Well, you lose a couple of those and you start to, hey, wait a minute, returns aren't everything. What else have we got for security here? <laughs> So I now, uh, I now spread my um, private lending across various risk buckets. I look at everything between low, medium, and high risk. I make sure that I'm spread across the three to maximize my returns, but mitigate my risks. Um, multiple deals in each one of my buckets. And more doors is just another bucket. It's another way to earn, uh, earn those returns. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, as you say, you're an avid investor, but you invest with partners. I like that strategy for sure. So they do the work, you fund it, and then you both share share in the, in the profits of that, right? Well, I say that, but I also am running a construction crew and I've got four of my own renovation projects underway at the moment. So I do partner with others, but I also do my own. <laughs> oh, wonderful. You know, one of, one of the things that I wanna bring here because I've often been asked this question. If I were to dedicate my funds to private lending, can I actually earn enough to replace my income or have the time freedom to say, you know what, nine to five, sayonara. I can do what I need to do with my kids, my family, my traveling, and the money just comes in the bank. Have you, what's your experience with people investing in that strategy? Yes, you can. And you can still call yourself a real estate investor. <laughs> so a lot of people think if they're private lending, they can't really say that they're, they're a real estate investor. If you're private lending into real estate investments and you're backing real estate people, then yeah, you can. I would say that you're going to get a varying degree of returns and you should be very careful and cognizant about spreading yourself across the different risk buckets. If you go after all those 15, 20, 25% returns, you may find yourself hungry in a few years because the money may be lost. Um, those are higher risk deals if they're returns those sorts of returns. Um, you're going to be looking to spread across them. Give yourself an average of 10%, figure out what you need uh, to earn. And from 10%, I think you can go up and down just a little bit from there. And if you can live on that, then you've got money to support yourself. Strongly, strongly, strongly recommend to max out your TFSA. Get it going as fast and as hard and as furious as you can, because every dollar you earn in that TFSA is tax-free. So if you think you need $100,000 take home pay in order to live, you probably only need 50 if it's coming from a TFSA because you're not paying any tax on that puppy. <laughs> <laughs> great, great insights. And just so people know as well, when you're using TFSA, it's a little bit of a process to get it into some working projects. Right. So just be prepared. No harder than RSP. Same as RSP. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. you basically will work through a trust company or something, get it into yeah. the hands of people that can put that money to work for you. 
Yeah, there's a few trust companies out there that do it. I do recommend if anybody asks me, I recommend Olympia Trust uh, only because um, they have the lion's share of the market. So yes. when you're looking for legal assistance to read your documents or understand the process of what to do, mm -hmm. they're the people, the lawyers already know what to do because they've dealt with them a lot. <laughs> Whereas if you pick one of the others who could yeah. also be very good, um, the lawyers are going to have a little bit more time into their schedule to learn what materials and how to fill out their forms. Um, however, uh, you're better off to find the deal first and then move the funds over uh, because uh, sometimes um, at larger projects work with a specific uh, trust company. And if your funds aren't with that trust company, you, you have a, their deal hasn't been vetted for all of them. It's only vetted for whichever ones they brought it to. Right, absolutely. So no, those are brilliant, brilliant insights for sure. Because again, you know, uh, everybody who's coming into the space, they want a journey, they want to either make money. And, and again, one thing we should mention as well for people to understand, where, where TFSA is registered funds are concerned, usually the money's paid back, the profit you make is paid back into your account. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And if you're investing your cash money, which can come from your bank account, your HELOC, or wherever you're bringing that money from, you have some flexibility depending on the deal. Am I fair in saying that? You can get monthly payment, you can get disbursements. At the end of the deal, it's really a conversation to figure out what works with that particular project. If you are employed and you have T4 income or any income um, and you're doing private lending from cash, recognize that that cash earnings are going to be taken into your taxable income. Uh, so that is that's something that some people when they first start private lending, get a little surprised about TFSA, yeah. RSP, that money goes back into those accounts. It remains tax sheltered. It grows within the tax sheltered environment. It doesn't impact their, their taxes. Uh, private promissory note lending with cash. Yes, you are going to get a T5 slip. And if you're, uh, if you're not careful, you can bump yourself into a new tax bracket. So be careful when you're doing that. Make sure you get advice from your accountant and your professional team. Yes, it's a tough job making more money, Laurie. Yeah, it's so hard, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess some people get so upset. Well, I'm going to have to, I'm not doing that. I'm going to have to pay taxes. Explain to me where you earn money that you don't pay taxes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. I'd like to know that. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough problem because now I've made $100,000 more and what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> it's when It's when you only make like, $2,000 more and you're bumped into the 50% from the 30% tax bracket that it kind of, hey, now, wait a minute. <laughs> now they're wiping $1,800 right? I should have maybe put this in some in my spouse's name or done it joint or <laughs> something, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, this, this has been a really, really fun and educating conversation, Laurie. Me. I, oh, I thank you much. for that, you know. Um, and I think with our viewers as well, I, there's going to be value in this. And I, as for my viewers as well, I just want you guys to, to listen carefully to this segment and really understand that what you're searching for is very possible. It, there are many opportunities for you to either learn to raise your own capital or to invest your capital for a particular earning or rate of return. Laurie May has demonstrated that from basically starting from you know, her business of where do I start to, I love what I'm doing today, right? So the journey is just gets more and more exciting, which is why she has more doors capitals because it's just more exciting. <laughs> that my lawyer said, I don't care what you call this one as long as it doesn't have sweet in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I still want more doors. Oh, more doors. <laughs> that's, it. that's it, exactly. It's what the investors dream of, you know, so. So I think it's been good, you know, and again, um, feel free to reach out. I will put Laurie's May um, email and, and contact information in the chat. So when you go down in, in the chat below, you'll find the information there. Um, Laurie May, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's been very insightful. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, you know, I look forward to having you back in, in the future again, because I'm sure you're going to create more interesting strategies and more things that we can learn from. 
Thank you so much, Mitch. I would like to add that uh, while I do focus a lot on private lending, I am happy to talk to anybody about any real estate strategy. You don't have to be looking to get into private lending or get into um, uh, borrowing capital in order to have a conversation with me. I'm happy to talk about any of it. Beautiful. And again, that's a big contributor for us as real estate investors, because the educational components you provide and sharing your story really inspires us. But you do Aww, that so lovely, sweet. you know. So <laughs> we, do, we do appreciate that very, very much. I've heard so many people talk about the fact that they've had such amazing conversations with you. And all it was was just a chit chat for X number of time and they learned so much. So. Yeah, usually about half an hour. And I just, I enjoy it. I get to meet so many different people doing so many amazing things. It's, it's a lot of fun. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much, Laurie May, and have yourself a great day. You have a sweet day too, Mitch. Thank you.